Good morning, everybody. I say First Chronicles 16, 1623. Sing to the Lord, all the earth. Tell of his salvation from day to day. On that, let's stand in praise. O oh, great God. <laughs> the call to worship this morning. It's found um, in Psalms um, 107, 28 through 32. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He made the storm be still, and the waves of the sea were hushed. Then they were glad that the waters were quiet, and he brought them to their desired haven. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of man. Let them extol him in the congregation of the people and praise him in the assembly of the elders.
Praise the Lord. Amen. You can grab a seat. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Winthrop Street Baptist Church. My name is Grant. I'm one of the pastors here. It's great to have you here this morning. Dramatic change in weather from a week ago. I don't think anyone's complaining. Uh, not a bad weekend in February for us here. Hey, a few quick announcements for us. So number one, today is our final class on why prayer matters. It's not too late to join. So if you've missed the first two weeks, uh, we'll be meeting right over there in the circle shortly after service. Uh, we do have men's and women's Bible studies going on. If you're curious about the timing of those, they are outlined in your bulletin. We've got men's studies Tuesday nights, Friday mornings, women's studies Monday nights, and Friday mornings. So we'd love for you to get connected and hop in at those. And then lastly, uh, if you're interested in church membership, uh, we're starting up a class March 5th. March 5th, so a few Sundays from now. Uh, pursuing church membership is something you're interested in. It's a good thing to do. We'll be talking more about that over the coming weeks and months. That is all for announcements, so let's move to our reading of God's Word this morning. We are continuing in Mark chapter 4 today. So Mark chapter 4, starting in verse 35, we'll be reading through verse 41. It's up on the screen for you as well. So Mark chapter 4, starting in verse 35. Let's read God's word. <clears throat> on that day, when evening had come, he said to them, let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat just as he was, and other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased. And there was a great calm. And he said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? This is God's word. Let's pray together. Lord God, who are you that the wind and the sea obey you. You are our holy, sovereign, righteous, and powerful God. Lord, when our problems seem so big, pray, God, that we can remember that you are the one that rebukes the wind and the waves. And Lord, even more importantly, you are the one that has overcome and won against <laughs> sin, death, and the devil. Lord, you are so powerful, we are so small, yet we get it backwards so often. Uh, God, I pray <clears throat> this morning for Pastor Pete as he brings your word. God, that we will all be reminded of your goodness, your greatness, your graciousness, and ultimately your glory, God. And Lord, how in Christ, crucified and raised, we have hope of everlasting life in him through repentance and faith in you, Jesus. God, we do pray for this this morning um, for churches all around the world. God, we pray that your gospel will go forward, that Christ crucified and raised will be proclaimed, that lives and hearts will hear your word and your truth, repent and believe in you, Christ Jesus, that more and more will be added to the number this day that are being saved. God, we trust that you are the one that ultimately makes growth happen. And so, Lord, all we can do is, is cast seed and water and trust for your growth. We trust you to grow in our midst here at Winthrop Street, in the city of Taunton, and in the surrounding communities. God, we trust and anticipate what you're going to do 
And we praise you for the work that you are doing. We praise you for the victories that we see all around us, big and small, each and every day. I pray, Lord, that the eyes of our hearts might be enlightened to see what you're doing so that we don't get so busy that we miss it. Lord, in taking moments to pause and reflect and to praise your mighty name, Christ Jesus. God, we do pray um, for our brother Andy. God, just pray for continued health and recovery for him. God, we think of uh, Paul. We think of Vincent. God, we think of uh, Judy. God, just so many struggling with various ailments, illness, physical, everywhere in between. God, we pray for your healing hand to be over them and for anyone I missed. Pray for them as well. Uh, God, pray. we praise you that you are the God of comfort, that you are the healer, and God, that we can always go to you, that there are no conditions, that you are steadfast and faithful, even when we struggle to be consistent and faithful. We know that you are there for your children. We pray, God, that we can all go to you with hearts full of faith and belief, just like a child today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you would stand, we could continue praising through our doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him. And kids can be dismissed to Children's Church. And uh, as you have your Bibles open, let's turn to Mark chapter 4 is where we're going to be this morning. And as you're turning there, let's uh, pray together. Lord God, we praise you for you're the great and awesome and mighty God. And so this morning we come before you asking for you to open up our eyes to your holy and inspired and powerful word. We thank you for speaking to us this morning, and we ask, God, that you be glorified as your word is proclaimed, and that you would build up our faith, and that you would do the work of drawing people to yourself. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. It was a dark and stormy night out on the Sea of Galilee. So many books have started with that kind of what's turned into be a hokey line. But earlier that day, Jesus had been teaching from this same boat while the large crowd stood on the beach as they were listening attentively to the parables that Jesus shared with them. It was a long day of ministry for Jesus and the disciples, and now it was the evening, and they're heading out on the other side of the lake when suddenly a windstorm slams onto the waters, and the boat starts to take on water. The disciples are terrified at this great storm, but Jesus isn't concerned. Do you know why he's not concerned? Because he's asleep. So what will Jesus do in this situation? How is he going to remedy this problem for the disciples? And what Jesus actually does increases the fear in the disciples because they saw firsthand the power of Jesus, the divine power of Jesus. And so this morning, we're going to see that Jesus has authority over the wind and over the waves, and that shows his identity as God, and it shows that Jesus is the one that we can trust when we are in the midst of the storms of life. And so <clears throat> this morning, we're going to see something powerful and true and amazing about God and about our Savior, Jesus Christ. And this, this passage we look at, just by way of organization, there's three points in this sermon, because there's three points in the passage. When you read your Bible, your Bible always has an organization. 
that reveals the structure of the passage that you're looking at. So if you have your Bible open, you can look at this structure in Mark chapter 4, verse 35 through 41. There's a three-part structure because there's a word that's used three times. Can you see what that word is? Can you spot it? It's great. And in the Greek, it's the word mega. You know, what? That the, the word that we understand to, to describe something large, like the mega millions. It's a large amount of money. And so in this passage, we see a great storm, like a, a mega storm. We see a great calm, a mega calm, and a great fear, or a mega fear. So here's the first point that we see. We see a mega storm, a great storm. And this short passage is going to show us a life-changing truth about the power of Jesus Christ. So let's start by looking at this mega storm. So it's, it's evening like we had established. And what had happened earlier that day was another strenuous day of ministry in the life of Jesus. It started with this tense accusations from the Pharisees that Jesus was being controlled by Beelzebul, a demonic spirit, which was then followed by the family of Jesus trying to kidnap him and take him back to Nazareth because they thought he was out of his mind. And then they left the crowd to go by the sea, but this is where the crowd only grows and presses to get to him. And so he goes out onto the boat in the sea to teach, the parable, to teach in parables for the rest of the day. So with night approaching... Jesus gave the order to pull out. Look at verse 35. On that day, when evening had come, he said to them, let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took, they took him with, with them in the boat, just as he was, and other boats were with him. So Jesus, he was so tired from this day. And so he was urgent in this order that he had hit the, the proverbial wall in his ministry and in his life. And as they're leaving to go to the other side of the sea, where did Jesus go? He moved to the stern of the boat and where he laid down on a pillow and he falls into a deep, deep sleep. And so the boat lifted up its sail and they began the five-mile journey to the other side of the lake. And as they crossed the lake, they're being followed by other boats with them, filled with other admirers of Jesus. So you can just picture the scene here. So picture maybe the, the beautiful sunset as, as the boats are, are going across the calm sea. And the Sea of Galilee, which was also called the Lake of Gennesaret, is a freshwater lake that's surrounded by mountains. And in this region, it's an important lake because it's like a source of life to the whole region in Palestine. And in the boat with Jesus, there's multiple disciples who were professional fishermen. And so they knew this lake very well. They're well-versed. They knew the currents in the lake. They knew the mood of the lake. They knew the beauty of the lake. And they knew that traveling at evening was safer because that's, that's when the storms typically did not come. The storms typically came during the day. And that's usually when they fished, was, was at, at night when the water was calmer. And the Sea of Galilee, it had a reputation. It still has a reputation among fishermen of being kind of finicky. And the moods of the sea are fickle because of its location. It's 628 feet below sea level. And it's located between the Mediterranean Sea and the desert on either side of it. Which means that this lake is exposed to combining weather systems that make it totally unpredictable. And the mountains that are surrounding the lake are filled with deep ravines. And these ravines serve as like massive funnels to focus the winds down onto the lake without really any notice. And so violent winds can come upon the water without warning and can turn this calm lake into a roaring menace within seconds. And even with modern equipment, some people even today refuse to sail on the Sea of Galilee because of the fear of the violent moods of the lake. And so when the disciples made their evening crossing, they weren't afraid because they, they thought that they knew the lake. They know the lake. They prepared the boat, and they were ready to cross. 
Then the lake had a temper tantrum. Look at verse 37. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat so that the boat was already filling. So what happens is what every fisherman hates and fears the most. This sudden hurricane force winds hurled down the mountains onto the lake, causing the waves to crash into the boat. And this unpredictable storm has arrived, and the strength of the wind and the waves threatened to capsize the boat, this small boat. You know, a few years ago, they, they actually found a fishing boat that was dated from around the first century in that day, in that time frame, in the Sea of Galilee, and it was about 27 feet long. So you can picture what this boat might look like. It's large enough to have 12 men on it, or 13 men on it, and it's easy to kind of picture this kind of crude fishing boat in the midst of this windstorm that's starting to take on water from the strong winds, being tossed around. And even if these men were strong swimmers, they wouldn't survive because one high wave could brought them, bring them all to their death. In Matthew's account of this passage, he used the word uh, seismos, literally earthquake, to describe this storm. So I'm not really a, a seagoing person. I like my feet on solid ground. But if you've been on a boat in the midst of a storm like this, you've probably felt the, the stern plunge like an elevator, like down a mountain, and then rise up to the sky like, like a roller coaster. If you've experienced that before, I'm sorry. I don't know why, you've, why you would put yourself in that situation. But you can imagine the misery that these men felt on the boat. The disciples didn't know it, but this terrible moment in this miserable storm was a tool for teaching them about God and about his power. So this storm is actually a crucial point in their spiritual development and in their spiritual growth, which happens to be a universal principle for us even today as we spiritually apply this passage to us. So if we never experience trials, if we never go through the furnace of hardships and difficulties and suffering and stresses or failures, then we would never grow to be who God intends us to be. The storms of life are a part of our spiritual growth, the process of growing spiritually. The storms that we endure, they shouldn't surprise us. In fact, the storms that we experience are God-ordained moments where God is working in our lives to reveal who he is, who we are, and who we need the most. And so it's in difficulty that God often works his greatest work in our lives. Isn't that right? I think many of you have probably experienced that too. And during those hard times, this is where God brings us to the end of ourselves so that we're driven to him and him alone as our savior and rescuer. You know, you hear this, this kind of phrase, this maxim that God will never give you more than you can handle. And I think that's a complete lie. I think God gives us way more than we can handle so that we would turn to him and not rely upon ourselves. Because the reality is, if we don't face, if we didn't face any adversity, think of how proud and self-centered and arrogant and empty we would be. We would just think that life is about ourselves. And so it's in these moments where we are in the midst of a storm that we pray. You know, we're going through this class on prayer. Just stick around for it. It's been a great time. But we pray. We pray, God, Help me in the face of this storm. Be present with me because I know that it's in this storm you will sanctify me and make me more like you. And you'll help me to see who you truly are and who I truly am so that I can experience your great grace and sing with joy in your presence. And so it's in these times of our lives that we trust God knowing that we will be saved and that God will act so that we would be saved. And he always 
provides for us. He always saves us. He's always with us. And so the disciples, they didn't know that this storm was a growth opportunity. But do you have a storm in your life right now? Do you? Maybe you should ask God to help you make the most out of it. And so we see this mega storm. And now let's move into this mega calm. But before we see the calm to the storm, we have to find Jesus. Where is he? What is he doing as the storm is raging all around? Look at verse 38. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. I mean, this is as remarkable as the storm is, right? Jesus was fast asleep on the hard boards and a small pillow in the midst of a raging storm. I mean, this just shows how exhausted Jesus is. I mean, only the most tired and exhausted person would be comfortable sleeping on a hard boat with a small pillow. But that's what Jesus did. And he stayed asleep in spite of the howling wind, the spray from the waves, and probably the screaming of the disciples. But this is a lesson to us about the incarnation of Jesus. Here he is peacefully asleep in an exhausted body while the disciples were in total and complete panic. Like, I wonder if Jesus was snoring. You think Jesus had a CPAP device? I don't think so. But we shouldn't miss the detail here. It was Jesus who led them into the storm. For him, it wasn't an accident. God was not caught off guard here. You know, this passage in Mark is an echo of, of the, the call to worship that we read. So Psalm chapter 107, verse 25, it's kind of an allusion to what our passage here in Mark is, but it says, For he commanded and raised the stormy wind, which lifted up the waves of the sea. You see, it was God who brought about the stormy wind that lifted up the waves of the sea. The disciples were terrified at this, but Jesus was not impacted. And I don't know what they thought Jesus would do, but they were angry and afraid and that Jesus happened to still be asleep at their screaming at this mega storm. I, I could imagine they would have no alternative what to do but to wake him up. The waves kept growing and growing, and the storm got stronger and stronger, and they don't know what to do, and so they look to Jesus. And the perception of the disciples is much like ours in the midst of, of our storms of life. Sometimes we feel like God is oblivious to us, don't we? To our situation, and then we wrongly conclude that we're all alone, that no one knows how we feel or no one knows what we're experiencing, and that there's no hope but we're so wrong, aren't we? God knows every wave that falls upon us. God knows every heartbeat. God knows every breath we take. God knows every thought that we have in our mind. He knows every emotion. He knows our hopes, and he knows our dreams. And so on that, that tiny boat on the stormy sea, it was the object of the attention of God Almighty. God was present. And God is present with us when we are faced with difficulties. God's attention is focused upon us so that we would cling to his grace as the fuel to help us persevere and endure through all of our difficulties. But the disciples don't know this yet. And so they woke him up and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And they wake him up, and they rebuke him with just a ridiculous question. Because, of course, Jesus cared for them. Obviously, they're not thinking rationally. They're, they're thinking as, as someone would moments away from death. And so they're accusing Jesus of having no compassion about their impending death. Jesus, don't you know we're going to die? Don't you care? But this accusation against Jesus is really how mankind often feels toward God, right? I mean, think of all the complaints that God listens to from ungrateful mankind every day. 
He's bombarded with accusations from angry people that God is unloving and cruel and not aware, that God hasn't done enough to prove his compassion to them. But for us, we know that Jesus has proven himself to be faithful over and over and over again. But when we get in trouble, don't we sometimes get angry instead of increasing our faith? And so in our hardship, let's trust in the wisdom of God. Trust that he's good, that he's kind, that he's loving, and that he's present with us. Which means we should trust him instead of doubting him. But the disciples, again, don't see it. And so they wake him up. They do what the storm couldn't do. But thankfully, Jesus doesn't scold them for waking him up like we would. He was ready to take action. He wasn't groggy. He wasn't bleary-eyed. He didn't have eye crusties he had to take care of. Look at verse 39. And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. The wind immediately stopped at the word of Jesus. And there was a sudden and great, a mega calm, complete calm. The word that Jesus said here is, be muzzled. That might be familiar. This is the word that Jesus used in Mark chapter 1 when he first cast out that first demon in Mark's gospel. Be muzzled, demon. And now he's saying, be muzzled, storm. What that shows us is that Jesus is Lord, that he is sovereign over both the spiritual realm and the physical realm. And the, I try to visualize what this looks like. So if you're looking at this stormy sea, maybe from like a helicopter, and you're just looking down at it, when Jesus utters those words, peace, be still, you know what it's like? It's like the calm extended from Jesus outward that way in all directions. And the ripple of calm came over the water, wind, and waves immediately. And it was, be, it was as if the hand of God swiped away the wind and pressed down on the water so that it was as still as glass without even a ripple. That's how to get the attention of the disciples, isn't it? <laughs> there were probably some men still breathing heavy, but now with wide eyes, they process what just happened because they had just seen Jesus control the strong forces of nature by the sound of his voice. Jesus didn't need to pray to God. He didn't need to ask his father to deliver them from the storm. He just handled it. He just did it. Jesus gave the command and immediately nature obeyed. The wind and the sea heard the voice of their creator and instantly stopped. The wind was gone. The water didn't even have a ripple. This echoes Psalm chapter 107, verse 28. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He made the storm be still, and the waves of the sea were hushed. Isn't it so cool when you see scripture, talk about scripture? <laughs> Jesus stilled the storm. Jesus hushed the sea. What an amazing short little passage. We see his humanity on the boat, and we see his divinity on the boat. And the Bible affirms, and the church has always believed that Jesus is both fully God and fully man. The two natures are united in one person, 100% God, 100% man. He's the God-man. And his humanity is clear when he's in a stern on the boat, asleep on a cushion because he's exhausted from a long day. Him sleeping right through this storm is how deep some of us sleep sometimes. And this is the only time that we actually read of Jesus sleeping in the Gospels. But throughout his ministry, we see Jesus hungry, angry, crying. We see him dying on the cross. We see his humanity. But here we also see 
his deity. Because only God could stop hurricane force winds with a single word. All power belongs to Jesus Christ. Colossians 1, Paul says that Jesus is the creator. Colossians 1.15 says, For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. Everything was created by Jesus. Even the tiniest speck in the universe is the creation of Jesus. But not only is Jesus the creator, Jesus is also the sustainer. Colossians 1.17 continues, And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. You know, scientists spend hours upon hours for years upon years to try to figure out the mystery of how things hold together. When the Bible provides the clear answer to that question, that Jesus is the atomic glue of the universe, that by Jesus everything was created, and in Jesus everything holds together. Jesus is the creator, the sustainer, and the savior. And if you believe this to be true, then you are going to be able to endure the storms of life. That you can experience the worst pains and the worst hardships because you know that Jesus Christ will hold you together in his arms, in his gracious arms. You see, Jesus knew that there would be a storm on the sea for the disciples, and Jesus knows that there's going to be storms in our lives. It's not a matter of if, but a matter of when. And he brings the storms to us so that we would plainly be able to see his identity as the God who is present with us. And God is not only there, but God is there for us. There's a difference in that. He's there for us in the storms. And this is what he wanted the disciples to see, that he's God and that he's with them. So Peter, the Apostle Peter, is the main source of Mark's information in this passage, in this whole gospel, actually. You know, you see it's filled with, like, personal details that kind of reveal that it was an eyewitness account from Peter. And Peter, later in his life, he, he wrote his first letter. And he wrote in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12, he says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may rejoice and be glad when his, story, his glory is is revealed. You know, Peter was probably the most surprised at this storm, being a fisherman. He was probably surprised at this watery trial he was experiencing in the sea. But later in his life, he says, don't be surprised at the trial when it comes upon you to test you. It's because Peter can encourage us as believers to welcome these trials so that we would rejoice in Jesus because this is what Peter experienced. Peter learned this theology of the storms of life firsthand. It wasn't just theory to him. Peter is the one, one of the few people who actually saw Jesus say, peace, be still. And so Peter knew where the power came from. And so for any follower of Jesus, the storms of life will happen and we need to know that Jesus is the one who calms the storms of life, that Jesus provides the calm and peace for us in those storms of life as teachable moments, knowing that God is present with us. But Jesus isn't done teaching yet. We've seen the storm. We've seen the calm. Now let's look at the last mega fear. 
Jesus moves from quieting the storm to addressing the, the silent fear of the disciples. Look at verse 40. And he said to them, why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? I mean, think, of, think about it. After this miracle, how should the disciples have responded? Just try to think about that. What should they have done? I mean, they, they've seen Jesus calm this storm with mere words. They should have a better understanding of who Jesus is at this point. They should have an increased faith in the power of Jesus. They should have responded like Psalm 107 says. Psalm 107.31 says, Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of man. Let them extol him in the congregation of the people and praise him in the assembly of the elders. They didn't react like that. <laughs> Instead, Jesus looks at them and rebukes them. The disciples had failed at this perfect teaching moment. They didn't trust Jesus in the midst of this storm. And that's why Jesus calls them out, because of their lack of faith and their fear. And it won't be the last time the disciples come up short either. It's only, it's only until that they see the resurrected Jesus that they will fully understand what he did for them on the cross this doesn't mean this means that that we don't have any excuse <laughs> means we don't have any excuse now because we know that jesus is god we know that he rose again from the grave we know that he is all powerful and we know that he knows everything that we experience we know that Jesus has forgiven us all of our sins, past, present, and future. We can confidently say that Jesus rose again from the dead. We know that Jesus can be trusted no matter what. And we know that trials, difficulties, and struggles are God-ordained moments to increase our faith and to strengthen our hope in Jesus. So why are we so still, so still afraid why are we so afraid by the things that may happen in this life you know that's the thing with our fear our fears rarely actually come true but yet we're so afraid of what might happen why is that the case why does it seem like our faith can be so small in the midst of hardship See, we need to have faith that casts out fear. We need to have a faith that believes that what God's word says about the powerful love of Jesus is true and that he's with us. So do you trust in Christ's power? Do you believe in his love? Because this, that's the type of faith that will be victorious over the storms of life because we can see that Jesus is is in the boat with us. You know, don't miss the symbolism here. Jesus in a boat with his followers on a stormy lake, that's a picture of the church in the world, that Jesus Christ shares the boat with us, which means that the boat will never sink. It will never be capsized. It will never turn over. We may face the waves of suffering and hardship and trials. As a church, as believers in the world, we may face the waves of the woke agenda. We may face the winds of anti-Christian attacks against the church and against God's word. But we can have confidence that Jesus is with us in the boat. He's with us in the boat. So maybe you have storms ahead we we all will have storms ahead but jesus does deliver us with a word the same jesus who calmed the storm is the same jesus who is in you and with you amen so let's look back to the boat in mark 4 the sea is calm the wind has died down but the disciples aren't right look at verse 41 and they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this 
that even the wind and the sea obey him. There's something fascinating taking place here. Look at what's happening. Like it's no surprise that they were afraid at the storm, that the storm frightened the disciples. But once the danger of the storm and the sea and the wind was gone, wouldn't you think that the fears would go away? Wouldn't you think that the fear would stop, the fear would vanish as fast as the storm? But instead, now that the storm is gone, the fear of the disciples has increased. They have mega fear. The father of modern psychiatry was Sigmund Freud, and he said that people invent religion out of fear of nature, that humans feel helpless before a storm, earthquake, disease, or natural disaster. So Freud says that we invent a God who has power over the natural realm. And the God that we invent is personal so that we can talk to him, bargain with him, ask him to save us from the forces of nature, from the, the storm and you know, the, whatever the, the, nature, the natural realm throws at us that we invent God to help us with scary things. But then we look at this passage, and it completely refutes that theory. Because look at what happens with the disciples. The fear of the disciples increased after the threat of the storm was gone. Do you see that? The action of Jesus was more fear-producing in the disciples than the storm itself. The power of Jesus was more frightening than anything in nature because they were in the presence of the holy God. It was the holy God who was in the boat with them. You know, some say that the disciples believed a lie. But why would they invent a God that is more powerful and more terrifying than the force of nature which caused them to invent a God in the first place. That doesn't make any sense. Well, it's because they didn't invent Jesus. They didn't believe the lie. It's because Jesus is the holy God of the universe. The storm could take the lives of the disciples, but quickly they realized that Jesus could take their souls. They realized that in the boat with them was the living God, And their question is revealing. Look at their question in verse 41. Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? The old King James Version says, what manner of man is this? See, they're looking for a type. They didn't have a a category for this. They couldn't fit Jesus into a mold. They realize that Jesus is in a class by himself. You know, they'd, they'd never met anyone like him. They'd met men of all different types. They'd, they'd seen tall and short and fat and skinny and smart and dumb. They'd met Greeks and Romans and Egyptians and Sumerians and fellow Jews, but they had never met a holy man who could speak a word and nature obeys. They had never seen this. They never seen anyone like Jesus. Jesus was different. There was an otherness about him that made the disciples fearful about who he really is. You know, R.C. Sproul, he, he writes about this story and says that the disciples' fear of Jesus was the ultimate xenophobia. So xenophobia is, is the fear of another group of people. And so he says that The disciples' fear of Jesus was the ultimate xenophobia, the fear of the ultimate stranger, of the one who was unlike every other man. Isn't that true? And in spite of of the disciples' experiences with Jesus, as he taught, as he cast out demons, as he performed miracles, they still aren't sure who he is. And it causes them to be incredibly fearful. It's because they're in the presence of God. And as sinful humans, we're naturally afraid of the holiness of God, 
of his power, of his purity, of his righteousness. It's totally unlike anything we can understand until we come to Jesus, who's the holy God, but who's also the holy man. And he's the one who bridges the gap between us and the holy God. He's our mediator. He's the one who by faith we can know who God is by faith in the name of Jesus Christ. And amazingly, by grace, Jesus has provided salvation for sinners so that we can stand before the holy God and say, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. You see, Jesus was consumed by the stormy sea of God's wrath as he hung on the cross. Jesus endured the storm so that we could find peace and be saved. Jesus calmed the only storm that could drown us, which is God's wrath and judgment on sinners. Jesus calmed that storm by dying on the cross for our sins. And he died only to emerge from the storm, from the depths of the sea, three days later as the one who declared, peace, be still. And he says that to our souls, to the just and righteous wrath of God against sinners, Jesus says, peace, be still. That storm of God's wrath against us is gone by the grace of Jesus. So who then is this? He is Jesus Christ, King of kings and Lord of lords. And today by faith, we can know him regardless of the circumstances of our lives. So let's trust him, believe in his grace, and celebrate who he is with great joy. Amen? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you. We praise you for who you are and for what you've done for us, that in the midst of the worst storms that life could throw at us, we have hope, we have confidence, because Jesus, you're the one who calms all the storms and who calmed the greatest storm against us, that being the wrath of God against sinners. So Jesus, thank you for your salvation. Thank you for your grace. Lord, increase our faith. Help us to to continue to look to you in the midst of the storms of life, that we would not be like the disciples in fear, but that we would have faith, faith in the midst of everything that this life throws upon us. Prepare us for the days of suffering because we know that they are coming. If they aren't here yet, the suffering in our lives, Lord, we know you're present with us because you care for us and you love us. We thank you and praise you in your great name. Amen. could please stand.
before you in the midst of storms great and small, or mega and small, and trust that you, Lord, bring the calm and the peace, maybe not in the way that we envision that we need it, but Lord, the way that you have ordained and called and prepared us. Lord, when we are screaming and in fear and in panic, you're at peace. Lord, I pray that we can draw to you, Lord, that we can be more like Christ and be peacemakers in our homes, in our jobs, in our family, in our homes. Lord, I pray that we can follow your steps and have a deeper sense of peace knowing that you are God, you are sovereign, you are in control and ultimately we can bless and be blessed for you do the special. We praise you God, we thank you. It's in your name we pray, Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. One, one more quick announcement. I'd like to call up Pastor Daniel. Can you come on up, Pastor Daniel? I just wanted to uh, let everyone know, this is Pastor Daniel. He's pastor of Taunton Missionary Baptist Church, and they had their first Sunday gathering last Sunday in this room, in this afternoon. So I wanted to introduce him to you all so that we would all be praying for, for him, his family, and the church. And I, did you want to say something to us? or <laughs> Maybe you can give a benediction or prayer. I don't put you on the spot, but you're a pastor, so you can handle it. <laughs> just, just don't preach another sermon. <laughs> their gathering, bless their meetings, that people uh, would, would come to faith in you as they're, they're speaking in, uh, in Creole and French, and Lord, that you would just be glorified in their services, and God, that you would just do the work of drawing people and calling them beyond up to you. We thank you for this partnership and pray, God, that you be glorified and honored. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.